Last week we talked about the role of the Holy Spirit. We didn't get to finish. You know, I like to, I try to look at things logical, not with emotion. You know, just like Dragnet, you know, look at just the facts, ma'am, just the facts. And that's, that's really what I love the Bible about. And, you know, people can get caught up in emotion, but I try to look at things very logical, make sense out of it. And, if, you know, and to me, the Bible, the, you know, the Word of God is so clear, it's so logical. And um, it's so factual. And uh, like last week, we started off with this verse. For there are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. You know, Deuteronomy 6, 4, you know, it tells us uh, almost the same thing. And uh, one God, three separate persons. Three different roles. Last week, not going to go into detail like we did last week on some of this stuff. The last week we looked at Ephesians 1 through 14. We're not going to read it, but I want, uh, you know, it clearly outlines the Trinity. One God, three separate persons. Jesus Christ is not a man. And I tell you, the doctrine today is an attack, is an attack on Jesus Christ alone. They say he's a man. They say he's a good man. If Jesus Christ is only a good man, this, then this Bible's a lie. Because Jesus Christ claims to be the Son of God. He's not a prophet. He's not a martyr. And that is the attack. They don't see him as the Son of God. So the Father outlined the plan of salvation. Ephesians 1 there, you know, Ephesians 1 through 14. The Father said, if you want to be the elect, we know Calvinists have the doctrine of election. They have the doctrine of predestination. But they clearly missed the principle of election and prince and predestination because the, the, the Father is very clear. If you want to be the elect, it's in Christ. As we read there in Ephesians 1, 3, he tells us that all blessings are in Christ. In Christ, positional truth. So blessings in heaven, places in Christ. If you want to be the elect, it's in Christ. God never predestined anybody to hell or anybody to heaven. It's free choice. So the Father said, if you want to be the elect here in Ephesians, you must go through my son. If you want to be the chosen, you must go through my son. The Father never predestined anyone to hell or heaven. He did predestine the process of salvation to me. That is very, for me, that is very important to understand. That when Adam and Eve sinned, the father didn't be like, now what? He's, the, he's, he's omniscient. He's all-knowing, all-powerful. He knew man was going to sin, but he knew man had to have the option. He didn't want a bunch of robots running around serving him. He could have made a bunch of robots and made sure nobody sinned, but he wanted us to give free will. That we choose to serve him or not. That we choose to reject, reject Jesus Christ as our Savior or not. It is a choice. It is a choice. The power of choice. And sometimes we live and die by these power of choices. We live and die. And we will ultimately live or die by that choice. Do you re receive Jesus Christ as your Savior or do you reject him as Savior? Because you'll die twice if you reject him. A physical death and a spiritual death. But if you receive him... Maybe you'll only die a physical death. Maybe you'll be part of the rapture, but you'll never die a spiritual death. He predestined the process of salvation. So important to understand that. I think it's often overlooked. He knew Adam and Eve were going to sin. He knew Adam and Eve were going to need a sin bearer. Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ from eternity past always knew he was going to be going to the cross of Calvary. Jesus Christ carried out the plan of salvation. We know Adam and Eve, they were not under any different testament to be saved or any other covenant. They looked to the cross. Remember Jesus Christ in Genesis 3.15, the Father ultimately told them, you know what? Ultimately talking to Satan, the Father was talking to Satan, and he says, you know what? He will come. You're going to bruise his heel, but he's going to crush your head. That's what he tells them in Genesis 3.15. Adam and Eve are hearing this. 
They see, they know that the Messiah is coming. In Genesis 4.1, they're looking for this. Eve actually even says, here he is. I were looking for him. But he didn't come until 4,000 years later. We look back to the cross. And you know what? When we believe the plan of salvation, the third person of the Trinity seals us into the family of God. So the Trinity has very clear roles. And the reason I bring this up, two weeks that we're talking about this, because so many churches getting a lot of emails related to calling on the Spirit. There's a song by Hillsong now that they call the Spirit. When we're in the Philippines, somebody was singing that, and we had to, you know, we don't call the Spirit. Big movement today about that. You go in and you go into these churches and it's all about the Holy Spirit, but nothing about Jesus Christ. That's why I want to go back to the Bible and talk about these roles, because you know what? It's very clear what the role of the Holy Spirit is. We know the Father predestined the plan of salvation, the Word. In 1 John 5, 7, it says the Word, the Word ultimately carried out and completed the plan of salvation, and we believe it, then we're sealed by the third person. The Trinity is involved in the process of salvation. So we talked about the role last week. We talked about a sealing. We're going to quickly go through this. But we see the Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. It is the end of what we just read there in Ephesians 1, 1 through 14. This is the role of the Holy Spirit. Paul talking to the church in Ephesus. Says, it is a prison epistle. In whom you also trusted. We know in Ephesians 1, 7, it's talking about Christ. In Christ you trusted. After that, you heard the word of truth. After you heard, and they were, they were pagans, the church of Ephesus. They believed in uh, the God of uh, Diana, I think it was. And they, it, was a, it was a meteorite, something that fell from the sky. It, had, it was very, you know, uh, obviously probably looked like a woman, and it was uh, morphed here and there. And they were worshiping, worshiping up the, with this idol. And Paul went there on his mission trips, and he says, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed, sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So we know the Holy Spirit seals us. 14 tells us it's a guarantee, it's inheritance, which is the earnest of our inheritance unto the redemption of the purchased possession, unto the praise of his glory. So the Holy Spirit seals us, guaranteeing our salvation, and we know the Holy Spirit is a down payment guaranteeing us eternal life. So we, it's a ceiling, it's a down payment. Last week we got into the baptism. Baptism into the body of Christ. We brought up verses 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 13. For as the body is one, this body here today is one, hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body is also as Christ. And we know in Colossians 1.18, the, the head of the body is Jesus. But how do we get into the body? People today want to talk about a water baptism. Come up front, they'll have all of these you know, child little uh, swimming pools, and you can come up and get water baptized up front here. Clearly the wrong message. Is water baptism a good thing? Yeah, it has nothing to do with salvation. And ultimately we know through the scriptures it comes after you believe. Because it is a picture of Jesus Christ going into the belly of the earth. You are submersed under water and then ultimately you come out and ultimately a representation of the new life in Christ. So for by one spirit all baptized into one body. That's how we get into the body. We don't call the spirit. We don't have Jesus in our we're bat when we believe, we just read that we're baptized, identified in Christ. That's what Romans 6 is all about. Wherefore we be Jew or Gentile. It doesn't matter if you are Jew or Gentile. Guy that's been to prison or not prison. Guy that's got a million dollars or not a million dollars. Doesn't matter. Whether it be Jew or Gentile, we be bond or free. All but all made to drink it in one spirit. And we went into last week about the baptism, the process, because there are churches that preach that you receive the Holy Spirit when you get water baptized, you come out of the water, you speak in tongues, and that's when you receive the Holy Spirit. Well, you know what? It's a doctrine of the devil. Why did Jesus Christ die on the cross then? If you get the Spirit by getting water baptized and come up and just speaking in the Babel, then Christ died in vain. 
That's what Galatians 2.21 would be. He died in vain. It would be meaningless for Christ to have gone to the cross if you could receive the Spirit that way. So we know, we, last week we went through Ephesians. Now, these are all in the handout. You can go home and read them. We're not going to go into it because it takes a lot of time to read these. But you can look at Acts 8, 26 through 40. And here we have the eunuch and Stephen. And this one shows us at the end of, if you go to 36, 37, and 38, we talked about this last week, but I think it's important to highlight when the eunuch believed, in 36 there, and as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, Hey, here's where there's his water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? We know just before this that Philip preached Jesus unto him. The eunuch was reading in Isaiah 53. He was learning about Jesus, and he shared the gospel with him. 37, Philip says, Ah, if thou believe with your heart, intellect, you trust that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins and was resurrected for you? And he says, I believe that. 38 says, he commanded the chariot to stand still and went down to the water. The Bible is very clear. When it's a baptism of water, it comes after you believe, and they always have water with it. That's why Acts 2.38, I don't know, it has nothing to do with water. It's being baptized in the body of Christ. Acts 3.19. Acts, ultimately, we're going to read here in Acts uh, 19. But we go on here. So you don't receive the Holy Spirit when you're water baptized. You receive it when you believe. Sealed. So first we're sealed. It's a down payment. Now what we um, remember, all blessings happen in Christ. So as we believe, we get all of this at the same time. We are also baptized into the body of Christ. We become a member of the body. So water baptism is a testimony to the word what you believe, world to what you believe. Believe Jesus Christ down on the cross your sins, burial, resurrection. We know water baptism never saved anybody. Testimonial. Peter and Cornelius clearly define when the person should be by water baptized. The Bible tells us. So you have Acts 8, by gets saved, then goes and gets baptized. We know Cornelius in Acts chapter 10 tells us you get the Holy Spirit after you believe, showing us again. So clearly showing a person should be water baptized after you believe. It comes, that is when you receive the Holy Spirit, is when you believe. Because Cornelius there, we can look at, I think it's in Acts 10.43, we could jump down to. He's sharing, Peter is sharing the gospel with a Gentile. The Jews think the Gentiles got to be proselytes. They got to be converted first. They got to be physically circumcised they got to follow the law, then they can get saved. No, that's a different gospel. That's what Galatians is all about. And Peter, you know, he had a dream before this in chapter 9, and ultimately told him, God told him, you know what? The Gentiles can get saved just like you. So he went over and he says, To him all the prophets witness that through his name, whoever believeth in him shall receive the forgiveness of sins. And then Cornelius, we read on here in 44. While Peter yet spoke these words, sharing the gospel, they received the Holy Spirit. Yet people want to not look at this. They don't want to see this. Because it always comes back to Christ. And again, we repeated that last week. So Paul and John, Paul then in Acts chapter 19, he encounters some disciples of John the Baptist. Paul and John the Baptist, the disciples here in Acts 19, the Bible shows us that baptism, because these men got baptized, and they didn't have the Holy Spirit. Yet churches don't want to look at that. Baptism, they were baptized into the body of Christ. These men believed and were baptized into the body. Nowhere does it talk about water. Acts 8 check talked about water. Because if you turn over to Acts 19, I think it's a verse, might be verse 5. Yeah, when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. But if you go back and study chapter 8, chapter 10, where eunuch and ultimately Cornelius, ultimately it talked about water. Here, there's no water. Baptized into the body of Christ. 
because they heard the gospel. They received the Holy Spirit when they believed. So clearly you have the doctrine showing us how you receive the Holy Spirit. So again, let's pull up 1 Corinthians 12, 12 to 13. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body be many are one body, so also is Christ. For one, for why one spirit, we're all baptized into one body. Spirit is a ceiling. Spirit is a down payment. The spirit baptizes us into the body of Christ. So we know we'll receive the Holy Spirit when we believe the gospel. Last week we talked about discernment. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 10 through 14. Holy Spirit gives us discernment. You can sit in a church and be like, kind of question what's being said there. If you hear something, you're like, oh, that's discernment. It's understanding the higher things of God. Understanding grace. When somebody tries to slip a little bit of works in their sides, to slip a little bit of leaven in there, you're like, yeah, that's not accurate. But that's what the Holy Spirit does. Gives us discernment. But God hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things. Yeah, the deep things of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things to spiritual things. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolish in him, neither can they know them, because they are spiritually discerned. That's what the Holy Spirit gives us. Helps us understand the Word of God. Man will never understand the Word of God if they're not saved. That's why we have a thousand different religions in the world. To be able to understand the spiritual things of God, you must be born again. You must have the Spirit. It's what He does. Holy Spirit helps us understand the deeper things of God, helps us discern the truth. And we read this from 2 Peter 1.20, knowing this first, that an old prophecy of the Scripture is of private interpretation. We have learned through the study of Scriptures, you can never take one verse out like Acts 38, 2.38, and build a whole doctrine around that. Because you can never have one verse that contradicts the whole Bible. Take it out of, completely out of context. Which we know churches do. Understanding that Scripture will always support other Scripture. The Lamb of God, the blood of Jesus Christ, the perfect sacrifice, goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. That was all review. This week, here's what the Holy Spirit does. Holy Spirit tests the spirits, gives us discernment, but also tests the spirit. Holy Spirit tests the spirits. When you're listening to men, because the Holy Spirit gives you spiritual discernment, you can be like, wow, test the spirits. Because I tell you what, we fight not against flesh and blood in this world. I don't fight against men or women in this world. I fight against the demons, the principalities that we cannot see. We know in 2 Kings chapter 6, his eyes were open and there was, spirit, there was chariots of fire all around him. It is a spiritual battle out there. It's what Ephesians 6, Ephesians 6 is all dedicated to. Keeping that helmet of salvation on, the breastplate of righteousness. We know the shield of faith, the, the, the girdle of truth, the sword of the spirit, the word of God, which is the best offensive defense there is. But it gives us this testing of spirits. So we took at 1 Corinthians 2.14, which we read already, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolish unto them, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But here is what I like, is 1 John chapter 4, 1 through 15. And everybody that sits in the church across the land should be questioning this right here, right now, all the time, when they hear something on the radio, TV, because the Spirit, you should be like testing the Spirit. What happens here? You should be like, yeah, this is not right. And here it tells us scripturally what it does. It says, Beloved, believe not every spirit. Now the world would want you to tell you. The world would tell you. See, man will want you to think. Remember, man cannot discern the spiritual things of God. But man will tell you, you know what? We're all going to the same place. The Bible tells us right here, believe not every spirit. But try the spirits. Test them. 
whether they are of God. So to me, if they're not of God, where are they of? A third of the angels that have fallen. Demonic. Because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh and is of God. Yet everybody in the world denies that. You get a guy that denies that Jesus Christ is from eternity past. He's not a created being. He's a man. He's a martyr. It is not the Spirit of God. That's what the Bible tells us. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesses that not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist. But you don't hear people read 1 John 4, 1 through 15. Spirit of Antichrist. Whereof you have heard that it should come, and even now is already into this world. Already in this world, you are of God, little children, speaking to his children. You have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. We are of God, he that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God. True love is sharing the gospel with us because this is, he gives us the example here. For love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. Romans 5 8 demonstrates that love right here. That's what we told the kids yesterday. If somebody hasn't told you that you're loved, Man, us adults need to be told that we're loved. I get a text from my mom once in a while, you know, probably every other day. It says, to my little blue-eyed baby, I love you. She says that, and I'm just like, you know what? I like having those texts. I like seeing that stuff. We need to be heard that we're loved. Know that the spirit of truth, spirit of error, beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone that is loved is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth. Not, knoweth not God, for God is love. In this was manifested the love of God towards us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. That you might have life through him. Here in his love, not that we love God. See, everybody wants to reach up to God and say, Here, here's what I did for you. Now, before we were even, before this earth was ever spoke into existence by Jesus Christ. He already knew he was going to die for us. He had already set the example. That we might live through him and hear his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us. And he sent his son to be the propitiation, the satisfied sacrifice for our sins, beloved. If God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. Now this is not a blind love of, you know what, and ultimately it's a freedom of choice. I can't tell, I can't control what people believe, nor would I want that. I respect freedom of choice. But true love is be like, you know what, let me tell you about Jesus Christ. There's only one way to heaven, it's through his blood, it's believing. If you reject that, you're going to go to hell. That's love. Blind love would be like, okay, believe whatever you want. That's not love, because you know people are in danger of hellfire. No man hath seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us. His love is perfected in us, where hereby know we that dwell in him. He is he in us, because he hath given us his spirit. We have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior. Test, testify. We speak of Christ here all the time. To be the Savior of the world. That's what we testify. That's what the Spirit does. Whoever confessed that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him and he in God. So testing the spirits is hearing the gospel. Hearing if the gospel be preached. Gospel in Christ. The gospel is we know that Jesus died for our sins according to the scriptures. 1 Corinthians 15, 1, 4. He was buried for us and he resurrected for us. That is the gospel. We can go back. I'll read it. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, and we know a gospel means good news, which I preached unto you, which also you received, and wherein you stand. 
by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. So any church, any pastor, any person denying Jesus Christ died on the cross for all sin, spirit of Antichrist, Denying his burial, denying his resurrection. We know there's a female pastor in church that she wrote an article denying the resurrection of Christ. Most people deny it. If you know, we read in 1 Corinthians 15 too, it says, unless you believe in vain, what people need to realize is really they need to read on because if you read 16 through 22 there, I think it is, if Christ didn't resurrect, then our faith is in vain. Christ, but ultimately it tells us he did resurrect. Our faith is not in vain. Yet people today want to deny his resurrection. So they don't see him as God. They don't see him as That is the spirit of Antichrist. They will use words. They will use the same stories. But they clearly don't have the same dictionary that we have. Jesus Christ was delivered for all of our offenses. Romans 4.25, what a great verse. Who was delivered for our offenses and, has, and was raised again for our justification. Raised for our justification. He died for our iniquities and he was raised for our justification. Hebrews 10.12, but this man after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sits, sat down at the right hand of God. He's already been resurrected and he's he is in heaven right now. So the Holy Spirit immediately seals us when we believe. It's a down payment guaranteeing our inheritance. Baptizes us in the body of Christ. Helps us understand the word of God. Giving us spiritual discernment. Holy Spirit helps us test the spirits. Identify Antichrist. We've got two more. It's a sign that we're God's children. Holy Spirit is a sign to believers that we're as God's children. Not all, we're all God's creation, but we're not all God's children. The Holy Spirit is another sign. It's a sealing. It's an insignia showing us that we are his child. We're going to look at some verses here. We'll start with John 1.12. John 1.12 says, But as many as received him, Christ, to them he gave power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So we have scripture here showing us that you become a son of a God by believing and then we're going to read more here in Galatians and Romans. The Spirit actually is a sign for us. Look at Galatians chapter 4, 6 through 7. And he says, And because you are sons, God has sent forth his Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father, wherefore thou art no more a servant but a son, showing us we are a child of God. But if any, and if any is son, then an heir of God through Christ. Look at Romans 8, 14 through 17. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage, again, of fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we're the child, that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ, and if, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. So God knows his children, for we are adopted into God's family, the ones who have believed that Jesus died for our sins and buried and resurrected for us. We receive this position of a child simply by faith. Look at Galatians 3.26. For you are all children of God by faith in Christ. That's what the Spirit does. Seals us. And I have you typically what are... Not there yet, but I want to. Seals us, down payment, guaranteeing our inheritance, baptizes in the body of Christ, helps us understand the word of God, gives us discernment, tests the spirit, shows us that we're a child of God. You know, I love the story of the prodigal son. Prodigal, as ultimately we know, is the, actually the word prodigal means spend money. The one that went spent his whole inher spent his whole inheritance. It's in Luke chapter 15, before you get to... Verse 11, you read about the lost coin, you read about the lost sheep, and they label it as the lost son. 
People will call it the prodigal son. People will call it, you know, the lost son. But, you know, I've actually struggled with some of those names before. I, I like to call it once a son, forever a son. Because the story's, the story's about two sons, not one. One son stayed there. One son left. Both were, two, both were sons. One never actually became more of a son than the other. They're both sons. This one stayed. Later on, after partying with the pigs, partying in the pig pens, spent his inheritance, comes back, still a son. What, would the, what happened to this son? This son got jealous of this son. So, you know, people will point out this son, but nobody ever looks at the second son. He was jealous. He wanted his whole inheritance. He did not want to give anything to his brother. But the story is this. They're both sons. And we read this. And he said, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that, file, that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living, and not many days after the younger son gathered all together, he took his journey into a far country. And there wasted his substance with the riotous living, and he, when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in the land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a, to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields of, to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat. He ate with the pigs. And no man give unto him. Boy, it just kind of shows you where the world is at. You know, you can count on your family. He went and feigned and filled his belly with the husk. Did he? No man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants to my fathers have bread enough to end despair? And I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father. I will say unto the Father, I have sinned against heaven before thee, and no man, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of the hired servants. And he rose and became to, came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him. Had compassion. He ran and he fell on his neck, kissed him, and the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe. Put it on him. Put a ring on his hand, shoes on his feet. Bring hither forth the fatted calf. Kill it. Let us eat. Be merry. For this, for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost, found, and they began to be merry. Now his elder son was in the field, and he came and drew near the house, and he heard music and dancing, and he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said unto him, Thy brothers come, and thy father hath killed the fatted calf because he has received him, him safe and sound. And he was angry and would not go in, and therefore came his father out and entreated him. And he, he answering and said unto the father, Lo, these many years I did serve thee, neither transgress I, any, I at any time thy commandment, and yet thou never gavest me a kid that I might marry, make merry with my friends. But as soon as thy son is, was gone, was come, which had devoured thy living with harlots, Thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. And he said unto him, said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. I was meet with that, should be merry, and be glad. For this thy brother was dead and is alive again, was lost and is found. We are a child of God. We're forever a son. Never lost that position. The Holy Spirit immediately seals us. They might not have had fellowship, but he was still his son. Holy Spirit immediately seals us when we believe. Holy Spirit down payment, guaranteeing our inheritance. Holy Spirit baptizes us in the body of Christ, gives us discernment, tests the spirits. It's given to us, signed to us believers that we're his child. Let me speak of the last thing the Holy Spirit does. It speaks of Christ. The third person of the Trinity speaks of the second person of the Trinity. The Bible tells us that. So I have always questioned, if I go in somewhere where and they're worshiping the Holy Spirit, I immediately be like, I, 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 the hairs on my neck go up. The Bible tells us that's not the way it goes. The Holy Spirit is the discern of truth and speaks of Christ. Look at John 16, 7 through 15. 
Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It's expedient for you that I go away. We know where we're at here. John chapter 16, we're in upper room discourse, speaking to the disciples. Judas Iscariot's gone, betrayed him. 18, he goes to the garden, and he gets arrested in 18. 17 is the prayer to the Father. We, we, are, we know we're in the last hours of Christ's life here when he's telling this. He knows what's happening. He's going to go to that cross from eternity past. Now is the, the point in time where it actually divides time. Where people went to the Abraham's bosom before, and now we go to, to immediately to heaven. It is a point in time that actually divides time. A time before Christ went to the cross and a time that is after. We have today men that want to change that. They want to call it before common era and they want to say after common era. They actually want to change before Christ, after died, B.C., A.D. It is a time that has divided time. And yet we have today men that want to say no more B.C., no more A.D. We want to say before common era, after common or common era. They actually want to change it. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away, for if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father. And you see me no more. Of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. Prophecy fulfilled 4,000 years later. He crushed his head. Satan defeated at the cross of Calvary. I have yet many things to say unto you. But you cannot bear them. Howbeit, when he the spirit of truth has come. He will guide you in all truth. Give you discernment. Give you understanding. For he shall not speak of himself. Wow. But whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He will glorify me. He shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I that he shall take of mine and shall show it unto me. Look at Acts 1.8. Just before Jesus ascends, he says, But you shall receive power. After that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall witness unto me in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria. We could say locally, nationally, and globally. We don't go and speak of the Spirit. It's something you automatically receive when you believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins, burial, and resurrection. And you receive all these things through Christ. Holy Spirit does not speak of himself. He speaks of Jesus. Holy Spirit doesn't witness to unto himself. He's a witness unto Jesus. Churches that emphasize the Holy Spirit or call upon the Spirit versus the blood of Christ. I question. I question their understanding of the Bible. I question which Spirit moves through those pews. Holy Spirit has a clear role, and his role is to highlight the importance. Look at Look at these verses here. I want to post, look at some. I, got, I, I should give you 2 Peter 2.21. I'm sorry, 2 Peter 1.21 first. I gave Ron a different verse first, but I want to look at this verse first because if you look at the Bible and you see ultimately what the Bible talks about, who wrote the Bible? First Peter, or sorry, I'm sorry, 2 Peter 1.21. And Ron will pull it up here in a second. Give me 121. Nope. My fault. I should have gave it to you earlier. For the prophecy came not in old by the time of will of man. Man just didn't sit on a rock and come up with this doctrine. God chose 66. Ultimately, we have 66 books, 40 different authors. God picked 40 men over 1,500 years to put pen to paper. But what were the words moved by? It wasn't man's opinion, but by Holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit wrote this Bible. We read in John chapter 16, the Spirit speaks of Christ. 
He wrote this Bible. What does this Bible tell us to believe? Look at John 20, 31. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ. Doesn't say call upon the Spirit. This Bible was given us that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ. He is the anointed one, the Messiah, the Son of God, the Son of God, that believe you might have life through his name. So, before we close, if anybody is, unique, is, is sitting here today is like, wow, that's logical. That makes sense. Because there is life after death. It's heaven or hell. It's your choice. Your choice. Now I want to show you something. Maybe today you understand the gospel. Some days people get it. It's like, wow, I got it. Now I understand it. But let this hand represent you and I while it represents our sin. God loves us. We read that 1 John 4, 7 through 10 there. But he hates our sin. Isaiah, I think it's 59, tells us sin is actually a barrier between us and God. A barrier. We're all born sinners. We're, we're actually conceived in it. Born sinners. The Bible tells us it's a death payment for sin. Yet man today thinks they can cover it up. They, can, they think he can turn, cover it up, turn from it. Thinks he could be, sprinkle a little water on it. Thinks he could ask Jesus into his heart. Thinks he could just become a church member, give enough money, do all these good things, outweigh the good, you know, with, outweigh the bad with good in his life. Take a little bread, drink a little wine, think it's going to convert. I don't know. Confess a little bit. We know none of that pays for sin. Because if it did, then Christ's death payment on the cross is, is in vain. But it's not in vain. These are written. Holy Spirit took 40 men through the scriptures wrote these all on the pens that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that you believe you might have life through his name. Let this hand here represent Jesus Christ. God from eternity past shed his blood. John 19.30, it is finished. Shed his blood. Buried, resurrected the third day. And says, you know what? I offer you this free gift, the gift of eternal life. I paid for all of your sin of past, present, and future. All I want you to do is believe. Holy Spirit emphasizing the finished redemptive work of Christ. And if you would believe that his work is put to your account, baptized into the body of Christ, sealed by the Spirit, seen as a child of God, the down payment, sealed, guaranteeing your inheritance into heaven. All these wonderful things that the Spirit does when you believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins, burial, and resurrection. Because the Spirit speaks of Christ. Let's close in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Father, again, we're just so thankful that we have the Word of God. It's so clear, very logical. And ultimately, we know the Word of God speaks of Jesus Christ. Speaks of his finished redemptive work. There was no mishap. This has been the role of the Trinity from day one. Before time ever was, before days ever even began, eternity passed. God the Father predestined the plan of salvation. Jesus Christ, the Word, knew he was going to carry out the plan of salvation, and he did. And the third person of the Trinity sealing us as a child of God for all eternity, guaranteeing our inheritance, a seal not witnessed by men, but a seal witnessed by the Father, just like the Son, seen by his Father. Nobody recognized the, the Son coming. Everybody thought it was a servant. Who's this guy to sell us something else? But the Father said, get me the finest robe, because you know what? It's a seal that the Father knows that we are his children. How cool is that? And Father, today, maybe, maybe, we know people are watching on the YouTube, and maybe today people are like, you know what, it makes sense. Maybe today, across the world, somebody will be like, you know what, that makes, that is so logical. It is, makes sense. And you know what, I believe that. I believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins of past, present, future, 
and he resurrected for me. I'm trusting in that to save me. That person can say, Father, thank you, because they've just been adopted into God's family. It's that easy to be saved. How great you are. Good, good Father, you are. That is so true. So, Father, we just pray that you'd be with the people this week, be with uh, the members of the body, and we just pray that people will be added more members to the body as they hear the gospel message because we know that your, your word does not return void. So, Father, we thank you for all your faithful children. And we just pray that you bless them. Bring us all back next week where we continue to give glory to you and your son. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.